All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with John Foster. We're at Ridgecrest Vineyards in, in the Ribbon Ridge AVA. That's July 26, 2023. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Uh, first question is why wine? Why wine? Wow, great question. Uh, the wine journey started a long time ago for me. Um, I've been in the service industry basically my whole life. Worked in restaurants through high school and college. Um, out of college, out of the business school, University of Texas. Um, started running restaurants. Um, so I've been around food and beverage um, my whole life and have enjoyed it my whole life. Uh, I would say I first got my wine interest or it was peaked in the Caribbean um, where I moved from Texas where I grew up uh, in 1995 dating myself there uh, but moved to the Caribbean uh, first in the restaurant industry there and then got, got into gourmet grocery um, which is where I really started getting into wine we had a tiny little wine cellar at the store that I worked at and the distributor reps would come in on Fridays and do wine tastings so I of course partook uh, and started falling in love with wine. So after 10 or so years, almost a decade in gourmet grocery, got into wine distribution in the Caribbean. So I was importing and selling wine um, to all the resorts and restaurants in the Caribbean. Um, did that for about five years. Uh, and then as I started to raise a family in the Caribbean, decided that wasn't the best place for us. Uh, so I moved to Portland in 2012 uh, to continue my wine journey because um, I thought it would be a great place, one, to raise a family, uh, but two, to be around one of the more respected wine regions in the world. So, long journey. Um, no, I guess, keystone moment in that journey that like sparked my interest in wine, but just always been around it and loved it. So talk about life before wine a little bit. You mentioned growing up in Texas. Tell me about uh, kind of upbringing, early life, and what you were thinking about as you headed off to college. Yeah, so uh, before growing up in Texas, I was a military baby. My dad was Air Force, so I spent a lot of time um, up until about fourth grade moving around from Philippines, North Carolina. I was actually born in Louisiana at Barksdale Air Force Base. Um, so I think travel's been kind of ingrained in me from a very young age. Uh, but yeah, I spent fourth grade through college in Texas. Um, which is not um, one of the more respected wine regions in the world, although they're trying. Uh, I think they buy quite a bit of Southern Oregon wine to make wine in Texas. Yeah, so I went to University of Texas uh, to get my bachelor's in business administration. Um, and like I said, I had been working in the restaurant industry through that and kind of stayed in that industry after that because it was easy. Um, so I didn't really ever have uh, a strong connection to wine. Neither of my parents drank wine growing up. Um, my mom wasn't much of a drinker at all. My dad would have beer when he was working on cars and stuff. So really until I moved to the Caribbean and got more serious in my career and life and a little bit older, um, did I start uh, finding kind of a path to wine. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was at um, a little store called Marina Market on St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, I worked for what I consider maybe my first great mentor in my life, um, a guy that was the owner of the store a couple years after I started working there, Frank Aliotto. Um, he's from the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, or was. Uh, his family, F. Aliotto Seafood family, um, grew up in San Francisco. I think one of his uncles or great uncles was the mayor of San Francisco back in the 50s. Um, so he was kind of a true like Italian, hardcore, um, like lived on a boat in the Bay Area around walruses and stuff, uh, but just a great mentor. He taught me so many things working at that little grocery store, just about business in general, uh, about how to operate, um, who to befriend and who not to trust, and so many things that I continually try to pass on to people I work around and with to this day uh, are things that he's taught me. Um, and he's the one that got me into wine. He was super into wine there too. Like I said, we had about a, I think it was about a 600 bottle wine cellar at that little grocery store. It was a tiny little, I think like uh, Green Zebra in Portland. I think it was about a 4,500 square foot grocery store, but a nice little 
wine section and because we were in the Caribbean, had all these nice resorts like the Ritz Carlton and Marriott, we had access to some pretty insane wines. Um, you know, we represented the company I worked for, we represented about six Oregon wineries, but we would get allocations from Italy, from France, from Domaine Romani Conti. I mean, all these iconic brands from all over the world would send wine to the Caribbean because they knew there was an outlet for those wines. Uh, and, and Frank knew that too um, at the store. So we had a kind of a crazy wine cellar at this tiny little store that catered to charter boats too. So there would be all these um, power boats and sailing vessels that would come to our store and shop for produce, meat, uh, but also wine, beer, everything. And of course, a lot of the people coming on those boats had expendable income and were looking for high-end wines, right? They weren't looking to have um, grocery store wines poured on the boat. They were looking for high-end stuff. So. Working there for 10 or so years, uh, like I said, just tasting wine, uh, working with Frank, bringing in wines from all over the world um, was a great experience and a great way to learn um, about wines from all over the world, um, which re regions did it best um, for each varietal. What, prom what prompted you to go to the Caribbean in the first place? Mm, yeah. Yeah, so back it up a little bit. In high school, my parents divorced. Um, they both grew up in Corpus Christi, Texas, so they were both beach people. Um, after they divorced, um, my dad moved to Connecticut. Uh, my mom moved back to Corpus Christi. We were in East Texas at that time. Um, she met a new guy, and they moved to the Caribbean. My parents had been to the Caribbean several times on barefoot sailing trips. Um, I had never been, um, so this was after college, when I was in the restaurant industry, the restaurant I was working for sold. I didn't like the new owners, decided to leave. And I was like, what am I gonna do next? And I was like, I'm gonna go visit mom. She had packed up a Jeep and moved to the Caribbean. Uh, so that was March of 1995. Decided I would go hang out with her for a few months, maybe through the summer, so three to six months, uh, and just have fun as a 20 something year old uh, on the beach in the Caribbean and just fell in love with the place. She left before I did. My brother came for one stint while I was down there. He left. Um, that's kind of the thing in the Caribbean. Most state ciders that move down there are there for one to three years. It's about all they can handle and they leave. Uh, but the Caribbean fit me or I fit it or both. I don't know. I'm a pretty laid back guy. Uh, so the island lifestyle and pace um, really fit me. And it was a great place to to grow in a career because the pool of great workers down there was pretty limited. So you could be a pretty big fish in a pretty small pond mm -hmm. with just a little bit of education and experience and drive. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't too hard. And still have fun on weekends and holidays and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so I was there from basically from 1995 till 2012 and I moved here with a one year hiatus in the middle. Before we talk about that, I'm curious about the, that kind of growth of your wine education. You mentioned before that restaurants and, and all the way up to like running restaurants. And yeah. tell me about that sort of life for you and what, what were the, what were sort of the highlights and takeaways from that part of your early career? Yeah, I mean, the highlights were um, working with great people and learning a lot about food and beverage and uh, how those systems work. Um, so just like basic, I don't know, call them street skills, right? You're opening restaurants and running restaurants and something doesn't work and you have to call somebody to fix it or you can learn how to fix stuff yourself. So I learned pretty quickly that Sometimes it's better just to take the initiative and do things than to call people. Um, but I was pretty young at the time too, like running restaurants. I was in my early 20s and I was managing people that were quite a bit older than me. Um, so really finding maybe my management style at a very young age was helpful, which would be to be proactive and lead by example instead of um, being reactive and telling people what they need to do and how they need to act. Uh, I think those were good life lessons from a very young age. Mm. Um, other good lesson was it's hard, hard work and <laughs> the restaurant industry in particular. Uh, the hours are grueling. Uh, I was probably working 
over a hundred hours a week um, for pay that you would <laughs> laugh at <laughs> as I laugh about it now. I think my first restaurant management job, I was making twenty four or twenty eight thousand dollars a year um, and working unbelievable hours. Um, so I think I learned at a very young age, but that was not my career path and life path. Um, but I did enjoy working with people, around people, for people. Um, so kind of take the good and the bad from that and try to continue with the good, uh, which for me took me into gourmet grocery for the next decade of my life, mm -hmm. which was kind of similar to the restaurant industry in a lot of regards, right? It's a lot of hard work. Um, it's very low margin. Um, and the hours are, you know, weekends and holidays and all those things. But again, as a young person without a family, those things are easy to do. Um, but as soon as I got older and started thinking about family life, um, I thought that that career path, switching from restaurant to gourmet grocery, was probably not the right choice for me either. <laughs> Uh, although looking back, there is a little bit of regret. I could have bought that grocery store that I worked with when Frank decided to retire um, and decided not to. Uh, I think it was 28 at the time, and the offer was to buy it for $1 million, which at that time sounded like an ungodly amount of money to me. Uh, but now, um, looking back on that 20 years later, uh, it was a pretty stupid move as a young child not to take that, or young adult not to take that offer. Um, that store in particular did sales of about four to five million dollars a year. Uh, so one million dollar purchase price was actually quite fair. Um, but can't go back and do that or change that. Um, that store is still there under three different owners since then now. Um, so my next path was to go work in the wine and spirits industry. So I took a job with a company called Premier Wines and Spirits uh, and worked with them the last six years that I was in the Caribbean. Uh, my position there was wine operations director, so they called me the big wad. Um, yeah. Uh, but that meant everything. Uh, for that position, I was running the whole wine portfolio and program, so a big part of that responsibility in the Caribbean was just logistics. So getting wine from France, from Italy, from Spain, from Chile, from Australia, New Zealand, all to this tiny little island in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. Um, probably spent at least half of my time just figuring out how to get wine there safely. Uh, and then the other half of my time was managing uh, a group of sales reps um, to go sell those wines, mostly to resorts and restaurants in the Caribbean. Um, St. Thomas, at least, is basically a tourist-driven economy. Um, there's really no other means of producing anything or manufacturing anything down there. Um, so I spent a lot of time sitting at resorts trying to get wine on lists and um, tasting wines from all over the world to see which wines we should carry in the portfolio. Uh, and like I said, at that time, uh, the company I worked for, Premier, represented, I believe, six or seven Oregon wineries, including Beaufrere, Domaine Serene, Willa Kinsey, Sokol Blosser, Ponzi, I'm leaving somebody out, but pretty good, solid Oregon book uh, in the Caribbean. But that, I feel like that was a time maybe before, at least down there in the Caribbean, which was always maybe a decade or so behind the times where Oregon was still like an up and coming region. Um, so we didn't know a lot about Oregon uh, except where it was. Um, the nice thing for me is my wife, Stacy, uh, is from Wisconsin, but her brother, Toby, has lived out in Oregon since he left college in the early 2000s. So we used to come from the Caribbean and visit Portland, uh, usually in the summer, uh, to hang out with him and hang out with his two boys, our nephews, uh, but also to meet some of the suppliers that I was repping down in the Caribbean. So I believe my first Oregon wine experience uh, was with Kurt from Beaufrere when he was still there. Mm -hmm. and I believe he's at Soder now, or still at Soder, although I don't know that for a fact, uh, but tasting with him at Beaufrere. Um, up at the upper terrace and just being like in awe of how beautiful the place was and how amazing the wines were and how hospitable the people were. 
but on that same trip, or maybe it was the next trip, having lunch with Alison Sokolblosser when she was pregnant and uh, meeting the Ponzi sisters at Ponzi for an amazing tasting. So I feel like our Oregon's always been an easy place to come to, at least for me. A lot of people, especially when we first moved here in 2012, thought we were crazy moving from tropical island lifestyle to rainy Pacific Northwest. Uh, but I feel like the two areas um, have some similar vibes and feels. Uh, Portland is a pretty relaxed big city, uh, especially as you come out here in the wine country. People are very laid back and um, I feel like I was taken into the Oregon wine family with open arms um, before people even knew my history or story or anything, mm -hmm. which coming from the Caribbean was a complete 180, right? Um, spent 17 years in the Caribbean, was never made to feel perfectly at home, right? You're always an outsider um, when you're not second, third generation family there, so. It felt good to come here, even though sometimes the weather didn't feel as nice. Uh, days like today and this summer have been wonderful, as I feel like most people in Portland and around uh, wine country freak out when it's above 75 degrees. I'm like, bring it on. <laughs> bring me the sun. I spend half of my summer in Hood River just hanging on the beach and paddle boarding and absorbing the sun. A few hurricanes up here too, so there's that. <sighs> Way fewer hurricanes, yeah. <laughs> when we get the remnants of a typhoon in 2013, which kind of defined that vintage for us, right? But nothing like the hurricanes in St. Thomas. Uh, I was there for Hurricane Maryland that happened uh, the year that I moved there, September 15th of 95. It was supposed to be a Category 1 hurricane, which is 75 miles an hour, but by the time it hit that night, it was a Category 4 with tornadoes. I was already working at Marina Market at the time. Um, that hurricane destroyed St. Thomas. Uh, I believe the first people to get power on island were 35 days after the hurricane. Uh, and that was Red Hook, which was a little area that Marina Market was located in. Uh, so I was working at the grocery store from curfew to curfew, just selling people whatever we could get in the store for two or three months. Uh, we were the only store on the whole island to maintain power throughout that hurricane because we had this crazy British dude that was our generator operator that lived close by and he actually came out like in the middle of the hurricane to make sure our generator was running. Um, but yeah, that was pretty insane. Uh, and they've had a few major catastrophic hurricanes since in the Caribbean. Um, Still got lots of friends uh, down there, so still in touch with what happens down there, but feel somewhat fortunate that we left when we did, because um, that economy has definitely changed quite a bit because of the hurricanes. Mm -hmm. But you could argue that we're seeing a much slower change in weather up here that's uh, maybe changing the economy and how we can farm and produce and grow and sell wine in the Pacific Northwest as well. So I might that and talk about that a little, a little bit later. Yeah. Um, before we come to Oregon and your story, I'm curious about you mentioned sort of learning wine and having having a mentor and really diving into wine in this in this world. So starting with the the kind of the, the grocery part of things. Um, what were you excited about when, as you were learning wine? What, what types of wines excited you? And, and how did you sort of expand your knowledge and palate to the point of you know, feeling c confident in the role? Yeah. Yeah, ironically, the first wines that excited me were probably Sauvignon Blanc from Sancerre and Pinot Noir from Burgundy. Um, and still to this day, probably some of my favorite wines, although I try not to be stuck in one mode. Um, on what I drink or from where I get, drink those wines. Uh, working in distribution for six years, I think opened my eyes to the fact that there are amazing wines grown and produced and sold from all over the world. Um, there's not one region that does anything best. There's not one grape that should be considered the best. And to that point, there's also not one grape that you should say is not worthy uh, of your consumption. Um, you hear that about several different grapes, people that say, oh, I don't drink that, or I don't drink this, or I don't like that, or I don't like this, and I feel like they just haven't 
had the experiences and opened up their minds and palates to what's available out there. Um, so I feel like it's maybe partly our job as industry people to encourage people to do that, to experience new things, to try new things, um, to not get stuck in these, you know, modes of this is what I drink or this is what I like. I feel like that's kind of changing with, you know, the changing of the guard, uh, different generations, right? People as old as me or older. Uh, grew up in a time where people were pretty brand loyal, right? Um, when I first started in grocery, we had six or eight beers in the beer cooler. By the time I finished at Marina Market, we were bringing in as many, you know, craft beers, uh, which at the time were not considered craft today, but trying to expand, right, what people considered good and fun. Um, but I feel like today's generation, people a little bit older than my daughter, um, they're more dedicated to finding products that they believe in, right? That have a story, that have some passion, that maybe follow similar values to what they follow. Um, so again, I think it, that's easy to do from an Oregon winery standpoint. Uh, but back in the day when I was in grocery and then in um, distribution, uh, it, it was definitely an uphill battle. Um, being in the Caribbean um, at that time, I believe I was vegan uh, or definitely vegetarian, but definitely part of the time vegan. So my palate uh, was definitely leaning towards white wines. I was in the Caribbean where it's 85 degrees. I'm eating vegetables uh, or seafood when I was off my vegetarian diet. So I was always trying to push Sauvignon Blanc and Rosé and um, you know, lighter white wines. And I feel like, especially at resorts, people still, the people with the expendable income, drank what they thought they were supposed to drink, right? They were ordering came a special select cab because that's what the wine spectator or whatever they were reading was telling them they were supposed to drink, even though they're having whatever they were having for dinner. Um, so I, I feel like down there in particular, um, it was a, a, a push of trying to get people to drink what was appropriate. Um, and maybe that's still a bit of a push today, too, um, as I'm in the wine industry now and trying to sell our wines through restaurants and retail outlets. Anytime I sit down with a restaurant and I'm pouring Gruner Veltliner, which I'd say 50% of the consumers don't even know what it is, the only way that you're going to sell that wine is to pair it with something and let people taste it, right? Um, and I think that's really the only way to sell wine in general is to open it up, let people taste it, experience it, and then have a conversation about it. So whether it's retail or distribution or now for a winery, um, the best way to sell wine and have an experience with wine is to have it open. Um, you can put all you want on your website and on your label and into your packaging, uh, but if people never buy that wine for whatever reason and open it up, uh, you have zero percent chance of selling it. In addition to that notion, what else? Like, what what are the stories that sell wine? What what in the gourmet world, in the distribution world, especially in that in the grocery world? Uh, what are people excited about? What stories sell wine? And what did you find people like kind of clamoring for? Yeah, I think um, good stories and good people sell wine. Uh, going back to selling like rosé in the Caribbean, I couldn't sell rosé down there for the life of me. Even though everybody should be drinking rosé on a daily basis on the beach um, with food. Uh, but it wasn't really until Sasha Lachine, uh, who owns Whispering Angel, which is, I believe, the largest producer of rosé in the world uh, now, came to one of our events, one of our trade shows, and he's this big, gregarious French dude that was just like pouring Whispering Angel and Grus and all this rosé, and people are just attracted to him because of his personality and, um, you know, maybe being interested in rosé but not really knowing much about rosé. Um, so that's one way I think that you can sell wine is just to be um, an interesting person for whatever reason. And interesting is different for everybody, right? Like everything in wine, it's um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So what some people find interesting may be super technical. What some people find interesting may be somebody's 
hairstyle or music music they play or music they listen to. Um, um, but I think stories, as far as not being able to be in front of people and having a story behind a wine that can sell our wine, it's the same thing. It's something that um, is in connection with uh, a philosophy or a mentality that people have. Um, I feel like you know there's a lot of talk about craft beverages, whether it's wine or beer or spirits. What does that mean? It's a pretty ambiguous term, right? But it means that somebody has a a way of doing something, and that could be the farming, the production, the bottling, the packaging, it could be any of those things uh, that fits with your lifestyle. Um, I feel like being in Oregon, um, part of that lifestyle is being organic or biodynamic in your farming practices, um, being in touch with Mother Nature um, however you can with your bottling practices and packaging, uh, but also having a story um, that people can relate to. Um, so like our little logo slogan at Ribbon Ridge Winery is a dad, a daughter, and a hill. And I know some people have bought the wine just because of that. It could be a dad that has a daughter, it could be a daughter that has a dad that's passed away, anything like that, but it's a quick little way to make a connection, right? Harry is the dad when our winemaker is the daughter, and we're sitting here interviewing on the hill, which is Ridgecrest Vineyards. Uh, so that's a quick, easy way to make a connection with people. And they're like, oh, I want to find out more. And then they come and taste, and then you can have a more detailed conversation about what we do and how we do it and why we do it. Uh, and either that makes a connection with people or it doesn't, uh, but at least then you have a chance. It's hard to put all that on a label or even on a website, right? Um, even with photos and videos and all the tools available today, it's nothing's quite the same as having a personal interaction with somebody. What was the biggest change for you or the biggest uh, maybe learning hurdle for you going from gourmet grocery to distribution? What, how did that change sort of the work you had to do and the knowledge you had to have? Well, it really um, like brought everything into focus. Uh, gourmet Grocery, I think we had something like 12,000 SKUs in the grocery store that I was in charge of all of them from meat to produce to frozen to wine, beer, spirits. I mean, down there you could sell just about anything in the grocery store. Um, so it was really about managing the set and having what you needed but not too much of what you needed because some things expire. Uh, getting them to the Caribbean takes time, so by the time you get some stuff, it's already expired or close <laughs> to expired. We used to have to fly in berries and um, fish and certain things that have short life spans. Um, so, like going from that to spirits and wine was quite different uh, logistically. Spirits and wine is more about um, pricing and exposure and. Um, getting the product in front of people. Um, so you were going to people instead of people coming to you. Um, but in both situations, at least in the Caribbean, uh, logistics were a big part of it. Just having the products that people needed when they wanted was probably the biggest hurdle of doing anything else down there because there weren't any other hurdles. There weren't like everything was duty free, so there was no taxes to worry about. Everything was pretty open um, as far as what rules were in place. It's quite different coming here to Oregon or anywhere stateside, right? Where you have to not jump through hoops, but you have to do a lot of things just to get the licenses you need to do things. In the Caribbean, it was kind of do whatever you need to do to get things done. Um, but yeah, and the other, I guess the other big learning experience going from grocery to distribution, and grocery people come to you, they get the stuff they need, they pay, they leave. So you don't have to worry about payables. Uh, so accounting became a big thing, not necessarily for me, we had an accounting team, but just learning how that process worked of delivering product to somebody, dropping off a piece of paper and saying, okay, you owe me this money, and then collecting on that money was, quite interesting, uh, although accounting is definitely not my favorite subject. Um, 
I do it all here now in my career today, so learning how to manage um, incoming and outgoing expenses was beneficial uh, from a distribution point. It was a much larger company too. The little grocery store I worked for was fairly small and team and scope and warehousing and everything. And the distributor I worked for had warehouses on two separate islands, uh, much bigger operations. We're not only selling wine, we're selling beer, spirits, and a little bit of food. Um, so there was a lot more volume to deal with, uh, even though there were much fewer SKUs. I think it was somewhere between two and 3,000 items that we were carrying. So kind of getting a little more focus from a lot of SKUs in a small space to much smaller SKUs in a bigger space and then bring it to today where I'm working with like 10 SKUs in this tiny little space. Um, everything's coming from macro to micro throughout my career, I feel like. Well, let's, let's get you to Oregon then. So tell me, tell me about, as you're getting ready to leave, you mentioned Portland being a place for, for because of wine and because of family. Um, Why did you choose Portland specifically? And, and when you got here, what did you sort of foresee yourself doing? Yeah, Portland was chosen because my wife and I had a child in the Caribbean. She was about three and a half when we moved to Portland. So we took about 18 months to talk about where to move to to raise Layla. Um, and we basically narrowed it down to Austin, Texas, where I went to university, and I do have some family, uh, to Portland, Oregon, where my wife's family lives and obviously knew some people in the wine industry. And I think it really came down to, um, I had already done Austin, um, been there, done that, so let's try something new. Uh, and I think to some degree felt like uh, my brother-in-law and his family would be a better fit for Layla and maybe there's more opportunity for Layla here than in Austin. Uh, and definitely more opportunity for me in the wine industry here than in Austin. Uh, although, wine, you know, hill country around Austin is where there is uh, a wine scene in Texas. Um, Portland kind of fit the lifestyle to Austin's grown quite a bit since I lived there in the 90s. Uh, I think it's more than doubled in population uh, and it's very tech driven, whereas Portland is a little bit different. Um, Stacy and I are both definitely food people too. Mm -hmm. We owned a little bakery in St. Thomas. Um, that's what Stacy did for work uh, and loved food and felt like the food scene in Portland to go along with the wine industry was much better. Um, you're on the West Coast where the amount of produce that's available is unheard of, right? Like everything grows in the valley. Um, I don't think I'd ever experienced a strawberry until I moved to Portland and had a hood strawberry. I thought I had experienced strawberries and thought I hated strawberries. Um, but everything is different here. Um, the main reason was to have a place to raise Layla around family, though. Um, so wine was a bonus, um, but something that I think definitely played into the decision. Um, I thought when I moved to Portland I would stay in distribution, um, so I was applying with all the local distributors, um, not really finding work. Um, somehow met through friends of friends from being in distribution, uh, Sue Horseman from Willamette Valley Winers Association. Uh, at that time, she kept a little bored of people looking for work and people hiring. Um, so kind of like her own little winejobs.com. But I, I would imagine with Sue, it was just a little chalkboard or something at the office. Um, but she connected me with Harry Peterson Nedry um, maybe four or five months after moving to Portland in June of 2012. Uh, met Harry... I think at Panaderia Gonzalez in Newburgh, which is no longer there, uh, and had lunch and just kind of hit it off with Harry. He's similar to me in that he grew up in the South in North Carolina, kind of moved around a bit before settling in Oregon. Um, but he's been probably the greatest person I could have connected with uh, in Oregon as far as a mentor uh, and someone that knows the history and the industry 
as good or better than anybody else that I've ever talked to. Before we continue that, I'm curious, you obviously you mentioned you had an impression of Oregon wines and you obviously visited here. As you moved here, what were your impressions of the Oregon wine industry at that time? Um, and what did you sort of, what were the, what kind of, I guess, what impressed you about it? Or what, what did you see, what did you see happening in Oregon wine? Yeah, I didn't, like my exposure to Oregon wine, like I said, in the Caribbean was pretty limited. And I feel like, you know, back in the early 2000s to 2010, at least in the Caribbean, um, Oregon had not really come to the forefront. Uh, everything was still very California driven as far as domestic wine. Um, probably 80% of the wine that I would order for the distributor down there was California. Um, so even though I feel like looking back, I had a great little Oregon portfolio, uh, my exposure was pretty limited, you know. Pinot Noir, of course, was the focus, um, but we had some great white wines in our portfolio, um, some Chardonnays from Domaine Serene and, you know, the Soko Blossers white wines and Ponzi Chardonnay, Reserve Chardonnay. So I remember doing some wine dinners in the Caribbean with Oregon wineries and being super impressed with what they were doing. Um, definitely with Pinot Noir, but also with some white wines. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I was able to come out here and visit and meet with people, like I said, I just felt like people were very open and honest and transparent about what they were doing and how they were doing it and why they were doing it. And that just um, is endearing to me. Uh, felt very different when I would take trips to other wine regions um, that were more business driven and focused, right? Um, it was more about labels and volumes and having discussions on how much wine we were gonna sell or how many pallets we could sell. Uh, in Oregon, I didn't feel that pressure at all. It's more about, like I was talking about earlier, just opening wines and having a conversation and seeing if there's a fit, right? Not trying to force a square peg through a round hole, um, just finding the right people. So obviously for you, the, f the first person here was, was Harry. Uh, tell me about when you met with Harry um, and you hit it off, what, were, what, what was your first role as you started, when you came to work for him, what, what was it you were doing? Yeah, he hired me and another guy, Thomas Sikta, uh, at the same time, basically October of 2012, to be sales managers. Um, the main role that we had was national sales. Uh, so at that time, Shehalem was you know a 20,000 plus case winery. We were distributed in, I think, 42 or 43 states, uh, something like that. So pretty widespread distribution as well as some export markets. So when he hired Tom and I, we basically took a state map and figured out who would manage which states uh, to help sell wine. Uh, but we were also in charge of running the tasting room and that staff. Uh, so we were basically co-managers of the whole, whole sales team. Um, I had never done either role. Um, Harry knew that when he brought me in, but I think, like I was saying, I think he hired people based on personality and getting a good feel for them more than what their actual skill set was. Um, so he was just a great mentor in helping, one, taking on a brand that was already well established, right? So unless you um, totally messed everything up, um, it was all about learning and managing what was already in place and trying to help it grow a little bit. So that was super helpful, not starting with a new brand or a brand that was maybe on the decline, um, but also a very respected brand. Uh, I think Harry uh, and his daughter Wynn, our winemaker, both very respected figures in the Oregon wine industry uh, and anybody that knows the industry. So it's kind of easy to work for him because Everybody you talk to, especially in national sales, was like, oh, you work for Harry, that's great. Uh, we love Harry. Uh, you hear that all over the place. Um, you never hear anybody say the opposite or never think that somebody under their breath is going, oh, no, not that guy. We're not going to, what is he doing now? Um, so it was a great way to learn, um, a great person to learn from. And I still, to this day, learn something new uh, on almost a daily basis, uh, working for he and when. The other thing they let me do at Chehalem is jump in anywhere. Um, so I've been 
spending as much time as possible in the cellar, especially during harvest, uh, even out in the vineyard uh, to help with picking and just to see what's going on because um, I think the best way to learn anything uh, is hands-on. Uh, you can read about it, you can get acronyms after your names and initials after your names that tell you how smart you are about something, but until you get in there and do it, um, it doesn't really mean anything, right? Um, Harry mentioned that early on. I was like, should I go get my WSET 1 or 2 or you know any of these programs that are in place, which are great programs? He was like, you're welcome to, um, but you'll learn more here, hands-on, uh, than you will in any book um, and by taking any test. So I've taken that to heart. Um, could very well be the harvest intern this year for when, we'll see. Uh, we're in the process of trying to get Luann, our intern from uh, Bordeaux last year, back this year, but there's a bottleneck in Paris for work visas or work permits or something, so we'll see. <laughs> but I'll be there August 1st for bottling. I'll be on the bottling line. I've already been in the cellar several times this year to help clean barrels and rack, and I definitely try to give wind breaks during harvest to do punch downs or take analysis or whatever she needs. Um, so just learning both at Chehalem and now at this smaller thing we call Ribbon Ridge Winery has been great because uh, I get to wear many hats, um, which is something that I've always enjoyed my whole career, not being tied to one thing. So when he did hire, when Harry did hire me at Chehalem, had it just been as a national sales manager, I don't know that we'd be sitting here right now. Uh, that job required quite a bit of travel was very singularly focused on sales and uh, working with distributors and that whole three-tier system, which can be a struggle sometimes. So being able to jump around between national sales, direct sales, getting in a little bit of harvest work and stuff, uh, I think has always been a good fit for me and kept me interested and active and um, not getting stale in what I'm doing. So obviously you, you kind of went, you, as you mentioned, macro to micro and now working for a single brand, Shahala, but now at Ribbon Ridge. Uh, how does that change your work when you're selling a single brand versus the, from the other side? Uh, what did you have to learn, I guess, in the early days working at Shahala uh, from that perspective? Yeah, that you're just one brand in many, right? Um, so. I feel like Oregon has been very good in the fact that it's been focused on Pinot Noir. It's mostly focused on fairly small producers, uh, which there are a lot of. Um, so that feels great, being one of many and um, you know being part of this big group that's trying to create this energy to create demand for the specific region, not a specific brand or winery. But you can also get lost on that boat sometimes, right? If you don't focus on yourself and focus on what you need to do. Um, I feel like at Shehalem that was a little bit easier because we were a mid-tier brand. Like how you define small versus medium versus large winery is, I guess, somewhat debatable. But at 20,000 cases, we were one of the larger wineries in Oregon. Um, so you kind of had demand and draw because of that, but now going to a 2,000-ish case winery, um, we're literally one of many hundreds uh, in the Willamette Valley. Um, so partaking in Oregon Pinot Camp, which just happened last month, or IPNC, which is about to happen, uh, is not really in the cards right now for us because we really have to focus on what we're doing and who we are and how we define ourselves and become unique in this great pool of Oregon wineries. So it's constantly like looking at what we're doing and how we're approaching it and how we're communicating it to other people um, to try to make sure that we stand out but are still part of the larger group. Uh, it's a fine, hard balance. Um, to be a little bit selfish sometimes. Um, it's not really in Harry or Wynn or my nature to be like that, right? Um, it's all about participating and helping out and doing it whatever we can to, to help the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so that's I think the last five years or so been the hardest part for me and then just time management too because I'm taking on so many roles which I said I enjoy some of those roles I enjoy more than others so figuring out uh, what tools are available to help me manage those other um, aspects of what I do has been hard but I think it's getting easier there are so many tools today than there were 10 years ago or 20 years ago to help you with reservations we went live on talk today to manage our reservations or tools for accounting QuickBooks online you can open from your phone and check the status of something or pay somebody you know so the tools become available to help you be more efficient as a small team uh, and try to focus more of your time again back to telling the story and opening the wine in front of as many people as possible. Tell me about, you mentioned obviously the, the, the kind of the mini hats and the seller, seller vineyard work. Tell me about getting into production uh, and uh, learning it, uh, this the kind of that, that, that far into your career, jumping into the seller. Uh, what did you enjoy about it and what is it you kind of look forward to on a, a, for, on a yearly basis now? Yeah, I think the most enjoyable part is just the ex excitement around harvest, right? It's um, for when somebody that grew up on the vineyard, I think it's kind of in her blood. Harry grew up on a farm, so it's like in his nature, the, the different seasons, the growing seasons, as opposed to the four seasons that we're all familiar with. Although in the Caribbean, I wasn't familiar with any of them. Uh, there was one season. Um, so, you know, going from one season to four seasons and then now slightly shifting to these are the seasons that really matter for wine grape growing and for wine selling uh, has been a bit of a shift. Uh, but yeah, just the excitement around harvest and the fruit coming in and the smells and sights and sounds and getting in there and helping with sorting and okay, we're about to do this, uh, you know, you only get one shot a year. so. It's exciting and nerve-wracking at the same time. We've had a couple of pretty tough years, maybe four, you could say. 2019 through 2022 have all been um, challenging vintages, to say the least. So I think this year in particular, the excitement is we may actually have like a full harvest. Um, I better knock on something, right? Because uh, anything can change that um, in one day. Um, but yeah, the excitement and anticipation building up to it um, is a lot of fun. The challenges, uh, especially where we are now, the Carlton Winemaker Studio, uh, is really just the space for us. Um, there's a lot of grueling, hard, physical, manual labor involved in winemaking, um, which I don't know if a lot of people know about that, uh, but particularly how it's set up at the Carlton Winemaker Studio. Um, the barrels have to go in these racks, these OXO racks that are stationary, so you literally have to flip over barrels through an aisle and then lift them up by hand into where they belong before you fill them. Um, so I've got scars on my knees and hands and everywhere from banging barrels into stuff. Um, so it's a lot of like physical grueling work, um, but it's also I don't know, it, it feels good to accomplish it, right? Because you can see it happen before your eyes, whereas other things in sales and accounting and stuff, you don't necessarily see immediate results. Uh, in production, you see and smell and feel immediate results. Um, so I think it's, you know, it, it's great for that immediate satisfaction and, and anticipation, because even though you see immediate results, you don't know sometimes for two years uh, what that end result is going to be. Mm -hmm. So you put in all this hard work to hopefully make a product that everybody enjoys, mm -hmm. um, but you don't really ever know until you open that bottle in front of someone and have a conversation. Tell me about the, the, the transition from Shehalem to Ribbon Ridge. Mm -hmm. um, what made you want to continue on with the, the new small brand and how, if at all, did your role change with the new brand? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't say no to Harry and Wynn when they approached me. So they, Harry sold Shehalem in February of 2018. Um, so I was still working uh, for the Shehalem brand under the Stoller Group from February of 2018 until uh, November of that year when Harry and Wynn decided to offer me a job here. 
Um, it wasn't hard for me because I kind of knew once Harry sold Shehalem that it might go in a different direction. Um, so I was looking to change anyway. Um, when Harry called me and sat me down and I think we had coffee on the South Waterfront uh, and he offered me the job, it was without hesitation that I said yes. Um, like I mentioned, he's you know, a great mentor, a great person to learn from. Um, and I liked the idea of going back to something smaller even than Shehalem was, to really being hyper-focused. So going from 12,000 SKUs of grocery to 3,000 SKUs of distribution to, you know, a pretty big portfolio at Shehalem down to eight or 10 SKUs that we have here, all from one property. Um, which is a beautiful property, um, and to build something new and fresh and different with a long history behind it was just a new challenge for me. Um, presented some, again, new things that I had never really done before, like creating labels and working with artists and um, working with copywriters to come up with slogans and all these different things that when I went to Shehalem, all that stuff was in place, right? Uh, coming here, it's building something basically from scratch. And at this, that was one brand, Ridgecrest, but at the same time, kind of reinvigorating the second brand, RR, uh, which was a side project that Harry started at Shehalem. Um, so I had been familiar with the RR brand, um, which is a brand that was started at the 2002 vintage. Um, Harry and Wynn sold that brand at Shehalem. I think you could buy it at the tasting room um, if you were an RR member. Um, but as a Shehalem employee, I never sold that brand uh, except for one market visit in Florida where they had some in stock and I think we poured it in advance. So I, I knew very little of the RR brand. I knew basically what it was, um, had tasted it a couple times, uh, but be able to take an established brand like that and continue its legacy uh, moving forward and try to get more people interested in it uh, and at the same time build a new brand. Um, yeah, it was exciting, something fun and doing it with people I love, Harry and Wynn. I mean, couldn't ask for a better uh, founder or winemaker to work with. So with your with the new role here, um, how do you how is your how do you sort of split your time up and what are the sort of the various roles for which you're responsible? Yeah, according to QuickBooks, it's 60% sales, 40% admin. <laughs> I don't know. Different on a daily basis, right? I try to dedicate the first two or three days of the week to doing admin stuff, um, which is accounting and um, s systems management and email management. Uh, and then I basically spend latter part of the week and weekends doing tastings uh, and events. Um, yeah, it's a sometimes a hard balance and sometimes I'm trying to do multiple things at once and probably not getting everything done uh, as perfectly as I would like ever, um, but also learning, continually learning how to be more efficient in all those roles uh, and trying to keep the main focus still on sales uh, because at the end of the day I can help win and the seller as much as I want and go walk the vineyard with Harry and you know learn about how the grapes are growing and why they're doing certain things and when they're doing certain things um, but if we don't sell the wine after it's bottled none of that matters because we aren't a sustainable winery uh, we could be a sustainable vineyard and farm perfectly and do all that perfectly and put the wine and eco-friendly bottles and use eco-friendly, you know, paper and ink and all that stuff. But um, if you don't dedicate some time to sales, um, none of that matters. So that's still the bulk of what I try to do and spend my time on. Um, but a lot of that is managing different systems on how they can help me sell more wine and get more people in front of us and in front of the wines. 
curious about the the sort of the hospitality element of that hosting, hosting tastings, hosting events, things like that. Obviously, that that's that's a more recent part of your portfolio for yourself. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that. What do you what what is your sort of hospitality philosophy, and what do you enjoy about the work? Yeah, I think the philosophy is let people make their own decisions and try to guide them to um, a happy place. Um, I've been in too many situations where people are trying to force products on you um, for whatever reasons and try to make them fit you whether they do or not. So I try to take the time to learn about the people that are tasting with me to try to make them feel comfortable having an open conversation, not just about wine, about life, about everything. Um, I think a, a lot of people come to us because of our white wine portfolio. Uh, almost half of the 2,000 cases we make are, will soon be five different white wines. Um, so I think, you know, the people that walk in the door already, we have something in common, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, but it's kind of crazy just as you have conversations with people, how small the world really seems. <laughs> I have visitors from all over the world, uh, and if you just spend time asking questions and getting to know people, maybe not really even focusing on the wine sometimes. Sometimes I'll be like halfway through a tasting and realize we haven't even talked about the three wines I've poured. Um, because you're just trying to get a feel for what people like and enjoy and how you can relate to them, right? So it's really all about relationships, I think, any industry probably says that and tries to preach that at some level, but in wine I think it's particularly important because, you know, wine is generally consumed uh, with a meal, with other people, uh, and it's all about sharing something that you enjoy with people you enjoy. Um, so that's the environment I try to create here. Um, we've moved that from doing tastings at the yurt and the vineyard, uh, which a lot of people enjoyed, to bringing them here to this space, what we call a cottage. Uh, but just tried to make it feel like your living room, so a place that you can be comfortable and taste wines and hopefully find some that you enjoy and purchase them, join the club, come back. Um, all those things are definitely talked about. So even though I'm not pushing sales, I'm definitely um, talking about all the options that we have uh, available to people to try to make them comfortable and to come back as often as they like. But it's a fine balance. Um, I feel like sometimes you can be too pushy and sometimes you can probably be too casual about it. Mm -hmm. If you forget to make the sale at the end of the day or collect someone's information, then you've just, I won't say you've wasted an hour and a half of your time because you never know, but um, you gotta seize the opportunity. Um, we're not a high volume um, outlet, so it's not like I'm seeing 100 people a day and I can hope to just get you know one or two people join the club or buy some wine. Uh, my goal is that everybody that comes in here either buys some wine or joins the club or both. So as the as the project here moves forward and you and you're here, tell me about sort of what you're looking ahead to professionally. Uh, are there new new projects for yourself on the horizon? New things you're looking to learn, um, or any, any other way you see your role expanding or changing? Yeah, I think the the long term goal would be that uh, we get to a point where I'm able to hire some help, um, so I can delegate some of the responsibilities to other people and focus on what I enjoy and uh, am, am best at. Um, we've hired part time person to take over social media because I'm terrible with social media. Uh, we've hired a part time accountant because. None of us like doing accounting or are very good at it, um, though the tools make it a little bit easier. Um, so just always trying to um, focus my attention, again, back to sales and managing the brands uh, and how they look and feel on the website, on different platforms. Um, so continuing to grow that and to get more people here. I mean, that's really my sole responsibility. Um, moving forward, uh, yeah, besides um, delegating, I don't see a huge shift or change. Hopefully as those things happen, we can continue or start participating in some of those events that we used to participate in the past, like IPNC and OPC, 
we are participating in the auction this year, so we do still participate in the greater scheme of things, but also participating in um, different AVA groups. We're part of the Ribbon Ridge AVA group. There's been some emails the last two days about doing our next trade tasting with them. Um, we're also part of the Shehalem Mountain Wine Growers Association. Um, so really maybe spending more of my time um, as being part of those bigger organizations, which I haven't had the time the last few years to fully participate in, um, kind of participate in the background, but uh, maybe, you know, follow in Harry and Wynn's footsteps and be on the board of Lambert Valley Winers Association, or at least the auction steering committee, or um, get back into IPNC as a participating winery, things like that, that we haven't been able to do. What about outside of wine, anything on a, on a more personal level that you're looking, for, looking ahead to or excited about? My daughter's starting high school, so I'm looking forward to not talking to her for the next four years. Because uh, I have a feeling that's where we're going, although she's great. She went golfing with me yesterday, and there was another guy on the course that said, oh, my 15-year-old daughter would never come golfing uh, with me. Um, yeah, I've got a, a kid getting into high school, so I guess, you know, long-term picture for me is what does life look out, look like uh, after high school? Um, does she go off to college somewhere and then Stacy and I become empty nesters and how does that change our lifestyle or where we live? Mm -hmm. uh, when we moved to Portland, we bought a house in Woodstock in southeast Portland. Uh, again, I was thinking I would work in distribution, so being in Portland made sense. Uh, but now I'm out here three, four, five days a week, and that commute can get um, tiresome. Um, so we'll maybe be thinking about either moving closer to the valley um, or doing something completely different. You never know what the future holds. Um, there's still part of me that itches to get back someplace warm. Uh, so I've always, in the back of my mind, thought about how I can continue doing what I'm doing here um, part of the year, but doing something else or some part of this elsewhere part of the year. Um, should this brand grow, that could be, you know, living somewhere else part of the year and doing the national sales part of the role. Uh, and then coming back here through summer and harvest, which is the busy season here for tastings and cellar work. Um, which would be ideal because getting out of Portland in December, January, February, March doesn't sound awful. Um, but we'll see, yeah. I try not to tie myself down too much, although I think I did tell Harry when he rehired me in 2018 that I didn't ever want to work for another winery out here in Oregon. I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, I don't have any goals or ambitions of starting my own brand or a winery. Um, I've had a lot of friends that have done that uh, and some that are very successful at that. Uh, but I enjoy working for someone else and um, doing what I do for Harry and Wynn. Um, yeah, becoming a part owner in this small operation is definitely on the table and been discussed. So I would love to be um, more entrenched in that part of the business, although it doesn't really change my day-to-day -day role. Uh, it changes, I guess, um, the overall big picture of things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just continue doing what I'm doing and we'll see what the next four to six years hold for the Foster family. <laughs> Definitely not a scared scared to move. Um, but I definitely love this industry and love the people I work for. So mm -hmm. some maybe good decisions and hard decisions to be made. Mm -hmm. um, but I try not to look back too much on failed decisions in the past. Just move forward, right? Mm -hmm. Onward and upward. Sorry to dredge all that up during an oral history interview where we focus on all the decisions from the past. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's all good. <laughs> So many decisions. I think in high school, these guys came, was I in a church youth group or something? And these guys came around and tried to get us to um, sell water. Um, it was maybe Ozark. It was one of the like huge water companies now. And they're like, we got these five gallon jugs and we're gonna go door to door and sell water. 
And I was like, you guys are crazy. This had to be like 1985. I don't even know what year it was. Um, I was like, that's insane. Had I done that and sold water, who knows? I could, yeah, be a billionaire now. It's crazy how much bottled water is sold today. But yeah, you can look back on life on all those decisions, right? Having a child, getting married, um, opportunities that you said yes or no to, and ones that you said yes and failed or no and succeeded. Um, could your life have taken a different course? Of course. Um, but there's probably a million other things that have happened in your life that you don't even remember or reflect on that maybe could have changed the course a lot more. And we've all been through COVID in the last few years, um, but that started with me with a major snowboard accident. On March 1st of 2020, I wrecked my snowboard at the top of Mount Hood. Didn't realize I'd injured myself. Snowboarded all the way down to the lodge, started to drive home. As I was driving down Mount Hood, blacked out, totaled my car and wrecked it. Wrecked and totaled my car. Um, luckily somebody pulled over and helped me and called an ambulance, but I had apparently ruptured my spleen, snowboarding, was bleeding out internally, uh, thankfully wrecked my car and was rushed to Legacy Emanuel on March 1st for three days in ICU. Um, Harry visited me there in ICU, um, but they were like, you got to get the hell out of here. We're setting up tents for a pandemic. You have zero immune system. Um, but yeah, lucky. Um, so as many bad things that happened in my life, there was some angel or something looking over me that day that kept me alive to even do what I'm doing uh, today. So just got to be thankful that we're happy, we're healthy, we're trying to do the right things. Uh, and I feel like that's a constant theme out here in Oregon, right? People are trying to grow things the right way, um, take care of the land in the right way, take care of our waste and garbage in the right way, uh, and hopefully present a product that um, people enjoy uh, and consume in the right way. So speaking of kind of the organ industry, um, you're, you're, a, you're a decade plus into it now. Tell me about how it's grown and changed since you've been here and what the industry looks like in 2023. Yeah, I mean, the growth is just, I mean, it's easy to see the growth, right? Just in the number of wineries and vineyards and stuff popping up, even here up on Ribbon Ridge, it feels like we have uh, newcomers popping up on a regular basis. And for someone that's in the industry, it's hard for me to keep up. So I can't imagine, like, as a consumer, how you keep up with the Oregon wine industry, at least the minutiae of it, the number of wineries. Um, so it's, I guess that's a positive thing to see, right? That there's still investment uh, in Oregon. It's still a growing region. We still have plenty of room to grow. Uh, if you look at the map of the Willamette Valley and where there are vineyards planted and where there is plantable acreage, we've still got, like, we can keep growing forever, which is uh, a positive thing. Um, it's been interesting to see some of the bigger, more established players and brands uh, being sold uh, and bought by um, even larger um, companies from all over the world. Um, so I think, again, that's a positive thing for Oregon, seeing that um, as tiny of an industry we are, right? We make five or six million cases of wine or something like that. Uh, to see worldwide exposure and interest in the region is super positive. Um, because you never know, right? We're, we're here in it, and we think, or at least I think, uh, the Willamette Valley in Oregon is amazing. Uh, I tell people all the time that haven't been here before, I'm like, this is the best place in the world to grow wine. I can't say that from experience because I haven't grown wine everywhere, but I've seen charts and data on weather patterns and I, I read the news the wine business daily every day at least scroll through it and see that champagne got devastated or burgundy got devastated because of a hailstorm or a freeze i have friends up in the okanagan that lose six or eight or whatever percent of their grapes every year because of frost and freeze um, and it kind of puts everything in perspective that we're in this like perfect little valley um, 
not just to grow grapes, um, which is also great as the diversity in the Lama Valley, but to grow anything. We don't have hurricanes. We don't have massive hailstorms, although we do get them right. We don't have freeze issues, although, you know, 2022, we had that April frost and freeze event that was pretty catastrophic, or at least could have been. But those things are rare, right? In 2020, when we had the smoke, there was like less, I think less than a third of vineyards in the Willamette Valley had crop insurance, which is crazy to think about that, right? Uh, but even after the smoke, I think the number is still right around 50% of vineyards that even have to carry crop insurance because we don't have the threat. Um, so I think, you know, seeing that worldwide that's being noticed that it's a great place to grow grapes and a great place to live and a great place to raise a family um, it's just encouraging to know that we can keep moving forward and upward and um, keep doing what we're doing um, and it's I guess just reassurance that Harry and Dickie Rath and Dick Ponzi and the Campbells and all those early pioneers what they set in place uh, has worked um, for 50 plus years and will continue to work for the next 50 plus years, hopefully. Uh, as long as we can continue growing grapes, uh, as long as climate change doesn't change that fact, uh, then we'll be all right. Um, and it's good to see that there's still continued diversity out here, that it's not just vineyard land everywhere in the valley, right? There's hazelnuts and orchards and berries and Christmas tree farms and grass seed and you name it, um, everything, you know, the agriculture out here is thriving. Um, so even as we've gotten warmer and climate change has made it a little bit more difficult for us, um, there's always opportunity for other things and maybe other varieties. Um, maybe slowly over the next 50 years, the focus moves away from certain varietals and goes to other varietals, who knows. Um, we'll see, uh, but I think the future is bright um, and that's, you can't ask for anything more than that. So if we were to ask you for your advice or words of wisdom on getting into the Oregon wine industry, what would you tell them? Yeah, just come out and experience it. Um, we see that um, or have seen that from many events, right? People that come out for Pinot Camp or IPNC or just come out here for a week and do wine tastings and visit. Um, just come out and experience it. And if you love it as much as we do, you can become a part of it because we're always looking for good, honest, talented people, right? It's not just a, um, it's not a, one size fits all community, right? We need people that can do marketing and sales and accounting and uh, work in the vineyard and work in construction and do um, everything that goes along with being involved in the wine industry or you know this greater industry that is the Willamette Valley as a whole. Um, there's plenty of opportunity um, and it's just a, a wonderful community. Um, I don't think, you know, whatever your beliefs are, whatever your background is, I don't think that matters. If you want to be a part of it, if you want to be a part of this something that is special, you can be. Um, and I would encourage it. Last question for you. Yeah. Um, what are you proudest of or what is your, what do you feel like is your best, biggest accomplishment so far? Um, still being alive, <laughs> right? Survive the snowboard accident. I mean, it's family for anybody that has a family. It's just uh, being part of the family. So, you know, again, taking that from macro to micro, I'm part of this huge family that is Oregon, part of the somewhat smaller family that is the Lama Valley, part of the small family team that is a family-owned winery. Uh, but really, it's all about my family and deciding to have the courage to move to Oregon when I was already an old guy. <laughs> Uh, and become part of this uh, and to see the family continue to thrive. Um, that's what it's all about. Um, none of the rest of it really matters. Excellent. So all the questions that I have for you, anything I didn't ask that I should have, anything that we didn't cover today that you'd like to cover? I don't think so. You didn't ask me why I have a man bun. I mean, that's... <laughs> we don't ever ask those kinds of things on camera. It's, it, it, you, you really pull it off well, so... 
That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, for sharing stories with us, sharing obviously sharing this space with us, yeah. and we're going to let you off the hook. Thanks. Thank you.